I think anyone who knows a little bit about science will know about the absorption lines in the spectrum of light from the sun. This is kind of what it looks like. These are called Fraunhofer lines, named after Joseph von Fraunhofer. And that's who today's video is all about. We've got some objects, we've got some books, we've got some documents. Keith, you know where I want to start, don't you? Yeah, welcome to objectivity. I've always wanted to do that. You've done it. Yeah. He's quite so, good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have some original Fraunhofer apparatus. Original apparatus. So we've yeah. got a box within a box. Yeah, so this is apparatus sent to the Royal Society. Instrument number 48 in the Royal Society's collection. We can see it if we just slide the box. Oh yeah, lovely. I can see we've got like a metal tube, we've got bits of glass. Mm -hmm. It's a mixed bag of things. So Fraunhofer's instrument is, is based around a prism, which you can see just there, because he wanted to create a spectrum. In order to do that, he had to have light sources and he used six lamps apparently that went through six filters, so gratings, and I went through another grating and then he would observe at a distance through a mini telescope. So it's quite a complicated little setup, but what he's trying to do is to observe those dark lines in the spectrum. So Keith, a lot of people will be familiar with, and we've seen before, these kind of finished product spectroscopes. This is kind of the early workings of this. This is kind of him starting to think about how am I going to do it, these are the pieces, but it's before they've kind of made these complete set. Fraunhofer begins to work on this 1814, and uh, gradually uh, the apparatus evolves as new uses were found for it. Let's unwrap a few of these. It's like archival Christmas. Ah, right. So actually we've got another prism there. That's a nice one. May I pick this up, Ken? Yep. Wow. Different prisms. Look at those. Mm. It's easy to think these are just like lumps of glass, and they kind of are, but to think these are the ones being made and used by like the real godfather of this sort of science. But, but this is why he creates the instrument in the first place. It's nothing to do with astronomy in the first instance. He is someone who is interested in improving glassware, optical glass, and therefore he wants to understand the properties of different kinds of materials, light shining through them, particularly glass, and, and that's really why he's doing this. <laughs> that looks cool, looking at James, and it's all rainbowy. It's amazing. Now, I've never seen this before. This is the first time I've unwrapped this little pack here. This is quite fun. So the instrument was lent out to, to lots of fellows. I don't know what this would have been used for. Clearly someone has cut up a letter because you can see it says, Dear Sir, there. All oh, right. To, to, to make this thing. That's brilliant. So the Dear Sir is irrelevant. It just yeah. happens to be where they've cut up their letter. What did the rest of the letter, where did it go? Is there, is there an important letter with a circular hole in it somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He sent this to the Royal Society, but he wasn't sending it to them to say, look at the marvellous apparatus I've made. He was sending this as, here's something for your scientists to use. Particularly because he wanted to uh, prove that his, his methods were good for making better optical glass and therefore he could sell more instruments, including telescopes. John Herschel, whom we know, of course, went over to see him to have a look at his method. It's a bit of an advertising thing, really. He, he's telling English men of science that um, he's got the goods. Place your orders. <laughs> A bit like how these days someone will send a product to like Instagrammers and that hoping to get kind of, you know, yeah. a bit of publicity. If the Royal Society like your instrument, yeah. then you're doing something right. It's good. Send off to Germany to buy, a, buy, buy one of those. Uh, here's we, the big... We have to get the, uh, oh, this yeah. fella out. Here's your telescope, so just That's take the cover off there. Lens cap. Let me be... Look through that. I need a lens on the other end, I think. Yeah, okay. Nice. And obviously you could just attach different different pieces to the end, it looks like. Yeah, it would need quite a distance between the telescope and the prism. So that would stand on its own effectively. Right. Uh, and you would be observing behind it. And are these gratings? Key? I think that's what they must be. We ought to have six of them, I hope. This is a real little trick. It's, it's a full set of, of the kit you would need to do your observations. I wonder how long ago it was that this was last used, you know, in anger. I mean, well into the 19th century, they were still getting requests to borrow Fraunhofer's apparatus. And Ross's ID instruments went all over the world. 
By the time the government grant came along in 1849, uh, the Royal Society had a, a pot of money where it could buy instruments. So uh, many of the instruments we have are, are 18th century, this one's 19th. But by 1849, they, they built up a huge stock of, of government instruments that, again, they, they would lend out. Now, of course, no objectivity video is complete without some accompanying documents and other treasures dug up by Keith and you haven't let us down. Well, we have here the personal recollections of Mary Somerville. Of course, Mary Somerville wasn't able to be a fellow of the Royal Society because they weren't electing women in those days, but she was a great mathematician, physicist, and uh, this is her life story. She, she wrote up her life. And there's an interesting passage in here that I think we, we ought to read. Now, Keith, I think it's only appropriate that we go over to that fabulous bust of Mary Somerville over there for this reading. Yeah, what do so you, say? You, can, you can pretend she's doing the talking. Okay. <laughs> Here is Mary Somerville. Should have been a fellow, really, shouldn't she? Should have been, yes. Yeah. And she was really held in great esteem by fellows of the Royal Society. And of course, that's why they commissioned the Francis Chantry bust. But here's her personal recollections, edited by her daughter. She gives a little account of uh, those spectral lines that we were talking about. So she says, One bright morning, Dr. Wollaston came to pay us a visit in Hanover Square, saying, I have discovered seven dark lines crossing the solar spectrum, which I wish to show you. Then, closing the window shutters so as to leave only a narrow line of light, he put a small glass prism into my hand, telling me how to hold it. I saw them distinctly. I was among the first if not the very first to whom he showed these lines, which were the origin of the most wonderful series of cosmical discoveries. But isn't that exciting? Like, Wollaston was actually the first person to see these lines before Fraunhofer, and, and he was like, this is like, this is yeah. history. Yeah. So Wollaston sees seven of these lines, according to Mary Somerville, but then Fraunhofer goes away and, and really studies them and catalogues hundreds of these things. So he really, uh, he goes really did the, the, the serious research. But she mentions him, doesn't she, here? Doesn't she later yeah, in the passage? Yeah, that's, that's right. So just to continue on here. So these discoveries have proved that many of the substances of our globe are also constituents of the sun, the stars, and even the nebulae. Dr. Wollaston gave me the little prism, I wonder where that is now, oh. which is doubly valuable, being of glass manufactured at Munich by Fraunhofer. Oh, okay. So they were using his glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now these spectral lines, you've got something else for us over here, haven't That's you? That's right. I, th I think uh, we've talked about them a lot. I think we should see them in all their glory. So we should see Fraunhofer's spectral lines. Okay. Wollaston first sees these lines in about 1804. Uh, Fraunhofer begins to look at them seriously, and this is his 1814 paper. Oh, the paper's in German. Okay. Oh, yeah. So not in, not in colour as we're familiar with it these days, but... No, not at all. Cheap printing, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you would get coloured, ver hand-coloured versions of these. But yes, this is his paper, and these are his spectral lines. Wow. Now, he doesn't know this at the time, does he? The, these are actually lines that are caused by absorption elements in the sun and the sun's yep. atmosphere. But at, at the time, they were just he was just mapping the lines, not quite sure what was exactly what was causing the black lines. That's right. He had a practical purpose for using them. But yes, it wasn't until decades later that Bunsen and others realised that actually these lined up with elements. Oh, and there's some of the instrumentation. Yeah. Look at that. So this is a series of tracts, so it's, uh, it's a collection of pamphlets and short papers that the Royal Society accumulated over the years. So they've just been bound, it's been bound together with lots of other papers about physics. And Fraunhofer almost didn't make it to do this, of course. There is a story that when he was first apprenticed to an optical glass maker, that the laboratory collapsed on him. He, he had to be dug out. So he had a narrow escape, but after that, patrons took an interest in him because of his escapade there. And that's how he got an, an education. They began to pay for his studies. It's a bit like the Faraday story in some ways. Faraday got his start because Humphrey Davy had a laboratory accident. It's always better when it happens to someone else, I, I would think. Uh, but again, these are the kind of accidents of history that without which, you know, maybe we wouldn't have had any of this. We know very well of, of Isaac Newton's prism experiments and, and, and breaking uh, white light into its constituent colours. And you can see uh, just through there, there's a, a prism, glass prism, 
Okay, so there's the prism. Now we'll put this eyepiece back into place, mm -hmm. back to the proper configuration. There we go. This is like the telescope. This is where the light's coming in. That's correct. You point this at your, what, something like the sun, I guess? Yes. Our light comes down, hits the prism, does yep. its thing. Yep. And we observe and it. This is the observer's position. 